Hey, great. So our speaker today is Jay Taneja, who is an assistant professor at the Manning College of Information and Computer Science at UMass Amherst, the Schema Lab, which is developing sensing and communication technology on societal scale infrastructure systems, and in particular in developing regions, which is informed by the fact that he spent three years working in Kenya. And so much of his work is based in Africa. He has access to some amazing data sets there. Um, and uh, he's been looking at a bunch of different things having to do with adoption of electricity and other uh, uh, technologies, I guess, broadly. And today he's going to talk about uh, remote sensing data for measuring the spread of buildings. So without further ado, uh, thank you so much, Jay, for giving this talk. We look forward to it, and it's all yours. Fantastic. Thank you, Keshe. Uh, thanks first for the invitation and uh, second, apologies for not being in person, uh, but very happy to engage with the group at at, uh, at Cambridge. And uh, I had made some time available for one on ones after, but very available for meetings afterwards uh, today, any other day. Really looking forward to interacting with this group. Um, fantastic. So uh, uh, the the nature of this work today is really thinking about uh, how the the longer record of satellite imagery that we have can enable us to look at problems in energy and in international development in different ways. And uh, I intend for this to be uh, a little bit about the method of how we we can use this uh, high resolution, long duration imagery, as well as uh, uh, hopefully a, a bit of a, um, uh, a call to thinking about other ways to use this technique. Uh, we don't we we have kind of a small case study of how we used it by looking at the change of buildings, but uh, there's hopefully many more ways that um, that we can look at these these long this long record of images and start to learn more about uh, the built infrastructure as well as natural infrastructure. Um, so uh, as a little extender on the the background that uh, Keshe have helpfully provided, um, I can uh, a little background. I'm a computing systems researcher. Uh, my my background is uh, uh, after my graduate work, I went to, uh, I, I flipped things a little bit. I went to join IBM Research in their new office in Nairobi. I got to see the office grow from about eight people to about 40 people by the time I left uh, and led a team working on energy there. Um, that has really influenced my uh, my research direction. And now we, we mostly focus on developing regions. Um, as uh, I, I've also broadened away from only energy infrastructure to thinking more about uh, infrastructure more broadly um, and, and have a great amount of uh, collaborations in, in a number of different types of infrastructure systems uh, uh, beyond, beyond energy. Uh, I've been at UMass since 2017 and uh, work with uh, a variety of uh, sensors and satellites and survey data in order to, to understand uh, this, this array of systems. Uh, so as a uh, brief overview of what my lab does, I run this the STEMA lab, the Systems Towards Infrastructure Measurement and Analytics Lab. And uh, this is meant to, to serve as just a very quick overview, uh, but should give uh, a potpourri of the kinds of projects we work on. Uh, in general, we try and find opportunities where uh, we can improve measurement of infrastructure systems, whether we're trying to detect um, where they are, uh, such as looking at uh, diesel-powered irrigation from, from satellite data by combining pollution information along with uh, environmental growth information, along with looking at performance of, um, of, of infrastructure systems. One, a couple of examples there are looking at uh, measuring grid reliability by measuring uh, small changes in the nighttime illumination of uh, of lighting, uh, looking at um, uh, the quality of roadways uh, by uh, kind of doing a, a very uh, uh, deep look at uh, individual patches of roadway and being able to uh, provide some indication of, of the bumpiness of that road connecting uh, two, two towns or villages or cities. Um, and uh, also doing some modeling and, and projection, thinking about what future energy transition aspects like the growth in electric vehicles or um, other systems like cooking and cooling are going to do, particularly to uh, electricity grids that are already fairly constrained in their operations. Uh, so really thinking about uh, what might be different in developing regions and infrastructure systems because of the constraints faced or other uh, local conditions. 
Um, so the the grand majority of the work is in Africa. I have a couple of uh, U.S. domestic projects as well. Uh, but again, the, the through line is measurement and infrastructure. So having looked at outages in um, this large uh, outage event in Texas, as well as uh, looking at the sanitation system and trying to understand what the range of um, uh, of delivery services look like for each and every single property. So there's a heavy kind of data science um, perspective here. Uh, and at the end, while measuring all this infrastructure and highlighting um, the the uh, service performance and, and access to these things, there's uh, clear opportunities to understand equity implications of, of infrastructure as well. Uh, can't do this without a fantastic team. This is just a subset of my team, but uh, we had a, a retreat last summer, uh, but really, really wonderful graduate students, uh, primarily from the African continent, just happy to assemble such a wonderful group and have people that are dedicated and focused to, to this kind of work. Um, so this particular uh, work I'll speak today is based on an upcoming paper that we're going to present at ACM BuildSys, which is in November. BuildSys is a conference on the built environment, hopefully familiar to many of you. Uh, it, it arises from the sensor network systems community, so heavily sensor oriented, uh, but expanding to infrastructure beyond buildings and, and thinking about uh, um, broader societal scale systems. This work was led by Dr. Santiago Correa, who is uh, a now a uh, data scientist at Block Power, a company that focuses on decarbonization, graduated from our group last year. And um, uh, this was a uh, so result of his, his work. And, and so I want to make sure we acknowledge that uh, uh, Santiago is, uh, is the, the prime uh, author here. Um, so uh, this paper, um, we we wanted to better understand how electricity systems uh, interact with societal development. And so thinking about this more broadly, uh, the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon had this, this um, quote at, at uh, one of his um, at one of his events, essentially and that energy is the golden thread that connects economic growth, social equity, and environmental sustainability. And as an energy person, this was very exciting to hear such high level support for these systems. Uh, but uh, as a skeptical scientist type, I really wanted to understand, we've always, our group has wanted to understand that are how these things tie, tie together. Can we better understand energy and economic growth and the relationship? And I think there's essentially a, a, a long understanding that, that it's important, but there, there's not any there's been decades of research trying to understand the the pathways, the causality, and and how these things interact. Um, uh, I'd say that at this point in time, uh, because you typically don't have the right sets of experiments to actually map out this causality, it's it's um, difficult to, uh, to to draw the through lines. But what we do know is that there are no uh, high income low energy economies in the world. So something there has to happen. It's just not clear what the exact pathway might be. Um, the other challenge that that interacts with this, of course, is, is climate change and thinking about how uh, goals for societal development interact with these imperatives for, uh, for, for moving our energy system to uh, largely renewables. And uh, this, this interaction is playing out in real time, seeing how uh, large scale investments are being pressured away from uh, from fossil fuels into into renewables, but how that interacts with other priorities that um, that uh, especially developing regions have around other um, around health goals and and other societal and income goals and other societal goals, uh, and it's it remains kind of a uh, um, a, a push and pull. Uh, in order to, to achieve this. We'd love to think we can have our cake and eat it too. And in some cases we can, but we do have to be mindful that uh, it's um, it, it's important to consider uh, what the local priorities are versus what the global priorities are and how those two things may not always be in alignment when thinking about how infrastructure gets built and, and where things go. Um, so uh, some... This particular work, uh, narrowing down a little bit, um, we wanted to really understand how access to electricity uh, affects people. And um, in many cases, we, we try and think about this at, at a larger scale, uh, 
Uh, we there are many ways to answer this question, um, social science methods and and quantitative methods uh, otherwise. But we wanted to really understand how migration is affected. Um, migration now is is certainly a, something we see over uh, years and decades. It's something we're likely to see more with with climate impacts, and we wanted to kind of better understand what that migration looks like relative to infrastructure. Uh, and, and so one challenge there is how do we measure migration at scale? Do we have the right tools to actually um, assess this over years and decades? Uh, and can we do it in, in a granular enough way to really understand its, its interaction with infrastructure systems? Um, and so looking more deeply at the, the techniques that are out there for understanding um, migration, uh, we we have to really wonder if they're accurate enough to trust. There's plenty of fancy data layers out there now that have really high granularity, but validation might be uh, a, a consistent concern. And so how do we uh, get to validating what we actually find and what we what we produce? Um, so for some context, much of the th this particular research was carried out in Kenya. This is a setting where, uh, I've I, I lived for a few years and built a lot of collaborations and connections, and it's a really interesting setting for the mix between global um, globalization and international development and, and uh, energy systems in particular. Uh, so Kenya has had huge investments in expanding the footprint of electricity grid access uh, as it's gone from being a lower income country to a low middle income country and with, with goals of going to be a middle income country in the next five to 10 years. Um, this shows uh, two particular um, time periods, and this was based on decennial census data. So that's what, what governs the uh, timing. This is about population density, and this is meant to give some context about Kenya. Um, Kenya is about 50 million people. Uh, the bulk of the population lives in the southwest quadrant of the country. So this is actually due to elevation in um, the southwest quadrants at high elevation, about 2000 meters, uh, while the rest of the country is at much lower elevation and, and um, uh, quite sparse. Um, there's a coastal uh, uh, depth as well, coastal uh, density as well. So this is meant to give an idea of where the people live, and particularly the middle graph is about understanding. Middle plot is about understanding where change is happening, where um, in this ten years uh, people moved and 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 moved around quite a bit. Um, in essence, we see substantial change percentage wise in the roughly unpopulated uh, north and northeast region, um, and we see a lot of movement happening everywhere. Uh, both movement as well as growth. So uh, as, as context, the population for Kenya changed um, uh, substantially uh, two to 3% per year uh, during this time frame. Uh, at the same time, the infrastructure systems are changing as well. Uh, this is uh, based on data from the Kenya National Utility, Kenya Power and Lighting Corporation, who have been close collaborators and, and supporters of our research for a long time. Um, and particularly, we, we were looking at transformer locations. So distribution transformers, essentially um, uh, access to the electricity grid is, is governed by being uh, close to distribution transformers. Uh, in practice, uh, the utility sets a 600 meter um, boundary around each transformer and says that they will uh, provide electricity connections uh, at a flat rate within that and um, a variable rate outside of that. So generally you see connections within that 600 meter radius of, of transformers. The left graph shows where transformers were uh, located in 2008. The right graph shows where they were located a decade later. Um, and so we can see where the, the preponderance of changes in this setting, it's, it's primarily in this dense Southwest quadrant of the, of the country uh, where we see a lot more transformers popping up, essentially serving um, where the bulk of people are. Um, so we, we can get an idea of where, where the change is. Uh, so uh, understanding how this, this change in, in people and the change in infrastructure, how these things interact, uh, we wanted to see what we could leverage from the best data sets that are out there on population. And uh, among those uh, particularly longitudinal data sets, so ones that are are uh, produced frequently. Uh, the best we could find was WorldPOP. WorldPOP produced at University of Southampton. Um, it provides 100 meter by 100 meter uh, population estimates on a yearly basis. The challenge with this is that this model heavily interpolates. It, it pulls from uh, the, the ground truth census information and it distributes population within administrative regions based on that. 
so what you largely see when you drill down in, in many settings is linear growth based on percentage changes, but not necessarily uh, any estimates of kind of where pockets are happening and, and variable rates within these 10 years, uh, as an example. Um, what, what we wanted to do in order to better understand particular bits of migration is really understand uh, how that, that detail works. Uh, and uh, one indicator of this is actually the spread of buildings, really being able to see where new buildings pop up. Uh, in this regime, in this setting, um, we don't have, we have this assumption that there are fewer buildings that are decaying and going away over this time frame, but plenty more that are growing based on the growing population. Uh, and so while we don't necessarily have an indicator of negative migration, we perhaps have an, a, an indicator of positive migration where new buildings are popping up. Uh, and particularly when considering electricity systems, uh, there's this in interconnection between uh, the expansion of the, the grid as well as to where it expands into, into new buildings. Um, and particularly as part of this, we have a, a now lengthy enough satellite imagery record uh, that lets us see these changes. And you, know, you need this mix between um, uh, a long enough record and a high high enough resolution or high enough detailed record to actually get at this. And, and we feel like we're at that stage now. Um, one thing I'll also say, uh, I would love questions throughout. I'm, this is meant to be a, a very um, discussion-oriented uh, presentation, so feel, feel welcome. I know the remote uh, setting doesn't make that always as easy, but I, I do not at all mind being interrupted. Uh, so thinking about what makes this record available uh, we and available for analysis. We have these two important uh, contributors, uh, likely familiar to everyone in the room, but uh, first we have uh, a, uh, what we require is high resolution satellite imagery. And when we say high resolution, here I'm talking about imagery that's uh, somewhat better than a meter per pixel of, um, of imagery. Uh, for context, uh, when we think about counting objects, uh, as, a, as a rule of thumb, we can think if you have something like six pixels um, of, of an object, it's it's more or less countable. So if we think about that meter resolution and six pixels, that's kind of a two by three um, meter object, like a car or uh, anything larger than that, uh, you, you should be able to count it with that one meter resolution um, uh, imagery. Uh, but as we kind of get increasingly better generations of satellite imagery, we're getting increasingly higher resolutions, uh, which allow us to count smaller and smaller objects. Um, and typically imagery now that is populating free sources are uh, at about 0.3 meters or, or lesser if you get to uh, denser areas, even 0.15 meter resolution uh, imagery. Um, the other important part of this is that the satellites are uh, revisiting these sites frequently enough that we get to see many um, uh, iterations of images over time. And so we can really see changes. There are uh, a, a variety of different satellite instruments that are measuring at, uh, that are playing with this this range of resolution and, and revisits. So one example is Planet uh, is, a, is a company that has a constellation of 200 plus satellites, and they're actually measuring the entire surface of the earth uh, every single day, but at three meter resolution. And so you can get an idea that they've, they've um, uh, reduced the resolution, but increased the, the revisiting. And that uh, enables a different type of, uh, a different set of applications. Um, in addition to this change in, oh, please. Quick question here about the satellite, the high resolution satellite. So typically kind of the work that we do here, we do the image a lot of satellites, but those are at resolution much more coarse, 10 meters of course, which is typically what we get for free. Now, when you talk about sub-meter or even meter resolution, are these available for free? So uh, this is this is great. Um, some of them are, and some of them uh, we have figured out ways to make them free. And I'll actually talk about one of those today. And that's uh, uh, carefully chosen verbiage. I'll, I'll uh, explain a little bit more about that. Um, but uh, as examples, um, uh, Planet imagery uh, is not free, but it is available at a significant discount to academic um, uh, collaborators or academic uh, users. Uh, the, the pricing here, at least I can just share that because it's, it's hopefully relevant. Um, you can get 15 terabytes of imagery for 15,000 US dollars per year. Uh, and uh, the, the cost per square kilometer ends up being far less than one cent. 
uh, which is is quite good. Uh, it's a significant upfront investment, but if you have enough different applications, uh, it can be quite worth it. Um, commercial high resolution imagery can be quite a bit more expensive. Um, we have seen everything from 10 cents per square kilometer all the way up to a um, $1.50 per square kilometer. Uh, and that has to do with, with um, uh, discounts, that has to do with, and this is for academic purposes, uh, that has to do with um, the uh, uh, changes in, in recent pricing, that has to do with uh, the the freshness of the the data product, so on, um, but it, it can vary. That that adds up quite quickly, and so uh, that's not quite as uh, as relevant. Um, but uh, what I'll talk today about is actually a, an imagery data set from Google Earth Pro that uh, we've actually figured out how to leverage, and I'll explain more about that. Um, so on, away from the imagery side is thinking about how we work with all of this data. This is an increasingly large corpus of information. Um, un, and uh, it, it's um, we we can lean heavily on our uh, on the amazing advances that we've seen in in uh, machine learning to actually process this this and make sense of what all this imagery tells us. Uh, so we have now in uh, these these wonderful pre-trained neural network models that we can leverage to um, to bring to bear on on a variety of tasks, and we don't have to train from scratch for every single task. We can build from the uh, the um, huge computing effort put forward in, in just analyzing imagery. Uh, and so this allows us to, uh, with minimal training time, uh, support a number of different applications in different domains uh, and do reasonably well at this. I, I don't need to go into depth about this topic, but it's uh, it, it's something that we very much um, leverage and, and benefit from. And, and so we're uh, quite happy to, um, to work in that way. Uh, so thinking about our particular um, challenge we're after. Uh, so just as in the population space, we also want to understand the building space and uh, the the growth in these pre-trained neural network models, as well as the availability of increasingly better and, and uh, frequent satellite imagery uh, has enabled a number of other organizations to work on uh, topics in this space as well. One example is the, uh, the Google Buildings, Open Buildings uh, data set. This is a data set released First in 2021, uh, but since with two additional refreshes, where they've where they've located all of the buildings across the continent that they can find from satellite imagery, um, and that in in 2021 was 516 million buildings on the continent. Uh, since they've now expanded to uh, South and Southeast Asia as well as South America, so they've got this huge corpus of of buildings. These are not just dots, but these are actually footprints. So you get an idea of the uh, exact coverage of the buildings. Uh, they do release some information about validation. Performance is strong, though there may be some bias to uh, buildings with non-natural roofs. If you think about um, mud and clay and, and other uh, uh, materials that might match the landscape, these would be harder buildings to find. Uh, these are only footprints. This does not include the associated imagery, so there is sometimes challenge with aligning the building footprints with other imagery data sets. Um, Google's not alone in this. Microsoft's released a, a comparable data set. Uh, and so finding buildings is uh, is not in itself a challenge, uh, though what um, what's important for our project is that the footprints don't reach back in time. These are kind of single instance data sets. Uh, and so um, while we can't necessarily uh, look back ten years with the with the available data sets, the data sets that are that um, are out there can be useful for model training with the caveat that you're using a learned data set in order to um, train a, a learning model to find uh, footprints in um, in uh, in images. And so there there's uh, kind of an a crude error that comes out of uh, out of those uh, procedures. Uh, but essentially we we again leverage fairly heavily what's out there and we train our models based on, uh, newer imagery with um, newer uh, building footprints. Uh, so to, to the question, accessing satellite imagery. Um, the, uh, the high resolution imagery that, that we leverage is, is from Google Earth Pro. And this is a, a desktop application that makes a, a, the tray of historical satellite imagery available. This is uh, 
often imagery stretching back 10, 15, 20 years, though, certainly with the older 15, 20 year plus imagery, uh, we have such low resolutions as to make them uh, not useful for our high resolution goals. Um, however, this imagery is not made available with an API. This is uh, made available through this application. And so um, we've kind of long sought a, a source for high resolution imagery that we could use at scale. And so we actually um, built a tool to access this imagery. And so uh, this is a, a kind of view of the desktop uh, application. This is from a city, a town in Northern Kenya. Um, and uh, the with Google Earth Pro, um, one of the, the nice features is being able to look back in time. Uh, so uh, you can see this, this little um, uh, clock button in the top, and it actually gives you this, this tray, each gray and a timeline, each gray line here represents a uh, distinct image from the uh, the historical record. Of course, you have all kinds of issues with clouds and, and other things on, on images, but you can go back in time fairly readily and see how, how places have changed. Um, Earth Pro also makes it possible to save individual images. And so um, as a low tech, but hopefully high impact solution here, um, we without getting into the, the uh, uh, internals of, Earth, of the Earth Pro application, um, we simply built uh, a, a, a daemon that's able to uh, scroll through images, save, 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 uh, and and collect um, images at scale uh, in a, a lot of settings. Uh, looking at the license terms here, uh, we don't immediately find anything where we're um, uh, violating, so we are uh, quite happy to, uh, you know, especially for, for research purposes, um, access this and, and it provides this wonderful library of, uh, of high resolution imagery going stretching back in time. Um, is, it, is the resolution approximately uh, one meter even for like forests and non urban areas? Yes. So the, the uh, resolution tends to be pretty steady in, in non, in rural areas. It's, um, it's that the the way it works is that the images are collected in swaths, uh, so long um, uh, long north south uh, um, rectangles. Uh, the difference in forests and in rural areas is that the update frequency is um, is not as consistent. Uh, in urban areas, you'll find um, monthly data typically. In rural areas, you might find, uh, every six months, 12 months, 18 months, especially as you go further back in time. Um, so uh, it's it, it depends on whether your application can um, withstand the kind of M, uh, the, uh, the uh, variable length between imagery, the variable durations between imagery. Uh, but uh, if your application demands high resolution imagery, we haven't found necessarily better sources, especially ones that stretch back in time, uh, particularly at the at the level of um, uh, not spending tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars on imagery. Thank you. Sure. Um, one, one other question. If I remember right, in Google Earth, you can also get the three-dimensional views of the building heights and so on. So presumably those are only over certain areas where they've flown aircraft. Uh, do those have different licensing terms and stuff? Like, are they hosted separately from the other data sets? Or that's a good question. I don't know. About, I don't know about the lidar data uh, that uh, that is in urban settings. Um, so we've long sought uh, widespread building height information, uh, and you can get that in select cities. Uh, but uh, here, we actually expressly sought after. Um, non uh inclined data so we get the the true vertical um but uh uh i don't know i would imagine that uh you wouldn't be able to access that information directly from this here uh, and part of the challenge is uh you can think of that as as some sort of metadata or some sort of additional information that's that's in here uh and here we actually recognize that because we're effectively scraping this imagery we actually lose a lot of the metadata um, and uh, we have one effort of trying to recover that, but I think understanding the additional data sets might be more challenging. Thank you. Um, so thinking about what this historical imagery uh, presents for us, uh, you have, uh, since you're working with a complete record here, you have 
uh, plenty of, of natural artifacts, cloud cover, shadows, fog, things like that, and plenty of artificial artifacts um, that arise from the, the instrument itself or, or uh, other, other challenges with that, that setting. Um, so blur, color accuracy, uh, co coloring, things like that. And uh, this variability is something that we, uh, we have to accommodate, we have to uh, account for. And so um, that uh, since we're so dependent on the, the high resolution record and we have very little control over what was what images were collected previously, um, we, uh, we we have to work around these things. Um, in particular, by scraping, we don't have metadata. So metadata here that's relevant are things like which satellite instrument was, was collecting this, uh, what time of day images were collected, um, what the uh, particular instruments capabilities were, or were there any kind of error flags on imagery that day or other things you typically get when you purchase imagery. Um, and so uh, we were somewhat operating uh, in the dark when it comes to the particulars of the satellite imagery we're working with, but we do have a large volume of imagery that we can, we can bring to bear on this problem. Um, so as an example, this is a, uh, oh yes, please, a question. Sorry, thank you. Um, quick question: With the lack of metadata, is it a, is it available online, but you'd need to like have a separate scraper to like download it, or is it that it's just not available? So typically, it's a it's a good question. the The metadata here is that we'd be after uh, understanding the the which satellite instrument things like that. We don't have direct information for it. With the particular satellites, there is a relatively small set of image of, of satellites that. Um, uh, are here, but we don't necessarily know exactly which ones were where and when. So much of the data metadata we'd be after isn't available, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Gotcha. Uh, isn't available to us. If we, of course, um, went to each of those vendors and purchased all this imagery, it might be different. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and we actually, in our group, we have purchased uh, imagery from a commercial uh, source before and, and understand what the metadata actually looks like. Um, but it's, uh, uh, it's not available with this particular imagery. Thank you. Uh, sure. So uh, looking at what this imagery, uh, how, how it uh, appears, this is uh, a particular setting in Kenya. And what I want to actually show is uh, what change looks like on this on this landscape. So this is uh, earlier imagery and then thinking about years later in this in this setting that actually has a lot of growth. So um, this is what the imagery looks like uh, in in a later time. You can start to see uh, quite a few more um, uh, uh, new buildings. We've actually also annotated this with uh, with dots to identify those buildings. Um, but just flipping back and forth, you can start to see more and more uh, kind of settings where there's there's additional um, activity. Uh, and, and so uh, these kinds of changes to the landscape are really what we're what we're trying to identify where um, where uh, there's new buildings, where there's there's new activity. Um, so thinking about what this looks like in uh, in, in a systems uh, context, so we have this this pipeline that tries to move from uh, this raw imagery into an understanding of where buildings are over time. Um, the raw imagery uh, is it has some processing to get rid of extreme artifacts, where essentially clouds or, or other um, artifacts prevent us from using that imagery at all. Uh, we move towards um, uh, processing imagery from different timestamps. Uh, we, uh, I'll discuss more about what this uh, GSD classification is in a minute. This is a way to kind of work with the, um, the metadata shortage that we have. Uh, but um, the, uh, the, the steps here are essentially to detect all of our buildings, uh, make a mask and, and uh, uh, see how that mask compares to ground truth just for the sake of uh, validating our, our approach, and then look at uh, changes in buildings over time so that we can understand as as um, buildings migrate, what, what does that tell us about, um, about these settings? Uh, so digging into this a little bit. First, I mentioned uh, uh, this metadata challenge. One part of the metadata that we, we felt would be quite important is understanding the ground sample distance of the satellite sensor. Um, ground sample distance is essentially the resolution of the, the sensor itself. The challenge with this is that the image that we get from Earth Pro is actually, you, you can ask for different resolutions of that image. So all they're essentially doing is resampling the underlying image 
uh, and providing you a, a higher resolution image likely. So with the higher resolution image, you don't immediately have the resolution of the underlying uh, object, uh, underlying image, but by looking at object sizes and, and other characteristics of the underlying image, we wanted to understand what the ground sample distance was. We figured that ground sample distance would be an indicator of the satellite. And we wanted to see if we, instead of training over a, um, a unified data set that actually had images from many different satellites, if we trained individual models for each satellite, would that improve our performance at building detection? Um, so uh, we can, uh, the, the rough idea was that we um, created images using uh, uh, downscaling techniques, uh, sorry, downsampling techniques uh, at a variety of different uh, ground sample distances. And we uh, built a, a um, CNN that allowed us to um, to find, uh, to identify which ground sample distance those images were. In a perfect case, we'd be able to identify this uh, uh, exactly, and we'd be across this, this diagonal line. Uh, in actuality, we do find some error in with particular um, uh, ground sample distances where uh, we were off of the diagonal and we're, we're misidentifying. But in practice, we this this performed reasonably well enough that we thought, okay, we can now take any image we find, identify the likely ground sample distance uh, of that image, and then train models specifically for a variety of ground sample distances. In practice, uh, the range of actually of labels in our um, uh, that we inferred were primarily sub one meter, so in in this region, the kind of fifty to eighty centimeter region of um, uh, of this confusion matrix, uh, but we wanted to see just broadly how well this technique work. Um, so uh, quickly moving to uh, to kind of another uh, effort we uh, we tried was to augment. And so augmentation is is valuable as a way to increase your uh, sample of training data. Uh, particularly with imagery, you can do uh, many different tasks to augment. You can flip images, you can rotate images, and that gives the uh, um, uh, the the model a, more opportunities to see different information or presented differently. Um, now, you want to think about augmentation as ways that will help you cover a, a more diverse array of circumstances. And so here we actually did um, particular types of augmentation that match the kinds of challenges that a, this learner might might encounter. And so with an original image, we might do things like change the brightness so that um, while we do know the labels of uh, of where the buildings are in our in our trained in our um, training data, uh, having a the same image but have uh, you know a darker circum set of circ set of circumstances um, could be useful for understanding when when you get darker images. Uh, we jittered colors, so we we changed the the color ranges. We blurred images. Um, these kinds of artifacts were, were fairly typical in the types of um, data we encountered. And so we wanted to make sure that our learner had uh, those more, more examples of those to, uh, to, uh, to, to build its model from. Um, so what does this produce? We take input images, we produce um, uh, these output masks, we compare those to the ground truth mask. And uh, how, how this ends up uh, working is we use a metric called uh, the intersection over union, IOU. Intersection over union is a spatial performance metric that essentially reports how well your uh, inferred labels match to the the actual labels, and it's a it's a proportion zero to one. Um, so looking at our our results, this these results are shown over uh, various years of imagery, so older images all the way to newer images, and we report on four different circumstances. One is not using either augmentation or uh, our ground sample distance detector that's able to kind of pick out the the uh, underlying resolution. Uh, and then one of those two things, augmentation and GSD, uh, and then both of those two things. And what we find uh, are a few things. One, uh, we clearly have worse performance with older images. So that's, um, that's less surprising. You have less sharp images. They're typically at, at worse resolutions. Um, so that's that's not cause for alarm. Second, um, the we that augmentation helped in most cases, uh, but the ground sample distance metadata technique did not help. Um, the thinking is that uh, perhaps if we had better metadata or um, that uh, perhaps,
perhaps the the like training methodology for the older images uh, could be improved or or other techniques but simply adding this this method and and using um, models per um, per ground sample distance type uh, was not a significant improvement um, I will say looking at the kind of quantitative scale here and understanding that uh, IOU is 20% with older images and 40%. These are actually reasonable IOU scores. IOU is a very challenging metric because um, when when you're slightly off, you get penalized for being larger. So your union grows and your intersection shrinks. And so uh, these are are not awful IOU metrics. We'd love better, but uh, uh, to to for some context, it's it's actually um, quite reasonable to work with IOU metrics at this level. Um, we looked at also counts and seeing if we identified buildings, and, and we did uh, much better details of that are in the paper. Um, so uh, for, now that we've kind of built up a technique that can look and, and count these, we want to understand how we might use these, uh, these um, uh, inferred uh, building locations. And so uh, as, a, as a case study, we wanted to, to understand with a... Um, with this uh, ability to look at, at buildings over uh, a decade, can we start to relate this to, to human behaviors? And particularly, we, have, uh, we, we wanted to understand how electricity access uh, either attracts or uh, affects um, the, the change in, in buildings. Um, now, we can't necessarily do this with, with perfect causality because we don't have uh, you know, contemporaneous surveys or, or randomized control trials to do this, um, but we uh, employ a technique called difference in differences. Difference in differences is an econometric technique that uh, aims to uh, create um, a, uh, a kind of before and after data set using uh, a, a natural experiment, a natural experiment that shows essentially um, some variable in the, uh, the, some intervention that occurred and you take two what you hope to be are um, uh, equivalent sets at, at the beginning of that time period, and then uh, see how change occurs over the, the duration. And so in our case, we took a thousand locations, one, one kilometer squared locations, roughly the footprint of a, um, uh, of a, a transformer. And we looked at uh, a thousand locations that received electricity access and a thousand locations that were matched to those locations that did not receive electricity access during this time. Um, and how we did the matching is we looked at characteristics of those those places in the 2009 timeframe, uh, looking at population, so getting an idea of density, looking at urban rural catchment area to get an idea of um, how uh, urban these settings were, essentially how, uh, um, how they, uh, related on this, this quantitative metric. And last, looking at mul uh, a multidimensional poverty index that tries to understand economic performance or economic uh, activity in these settings. And uh, just a, a brief summary here, our, our matching was rel was very tight. There's enough places to, to consider uh, from these data sets that we could find very close matches um, among, the, uh, among the set of 1,000 locations that received access and 1,000 locations that did not receive access. Um, and I, I uh, want to point out, this is essentially one of the huge strengths of working with satellite data is you have an enormous number of settings that, that you can work with. And so you can really expand sample sizes and, and try and find relatively small effects because you have the, um, the statistical power to do so. Um, so what does our, our analysis find? This is looking at uh, three conditions. One is uh, our uh, control setting. One is our treatment setting. Uh, and then the other is what we call our counterfactual. The counterfactual here is uh, uh, the if uh, the treatment settings had grown at the same rate as the control settings. Um, so what we measure on is the number of structures in those settings. Uh, it is somewhat unusual that the uh, that the control settings started with more buildings per settlement or more buildings per square kilometer, uh, distinctly more. Um, the rate of change uh, ends up being uh, substantially different that the places the treatment settings and in this case treatment settings are ones that received electricity access grew 15 percent more slowly than the set of uh, locations that did not receive electricity access during that time um, and this is somewhat un counterintuitive you would think okay well electricity access this is a great thing it, it's uh it signals that a place is, is growing that it's it's uh um, quality of life may be improving. Perhaps there are more economic opportunities. 
uh, and, and you would think these places would grow more quickly than the places that did not receive electricity access. And uh, over this, this large scale uh, with, with a um, statistically significant set, uh, we actually do not see that behavior. Um, so very briefly, why might this happen? And the, the kind of early um, uh, observation is we actually don't know. So this is one of the shortcomings of this large scale quantitative analysis is that you get no qualitative information. Uh, and, and you'd love to survey and understand what guided these decisions uh, to be able to, to um, make better policy recommendations, to, to make better uh, infrastructure decisions. Um, so some thoughts towards this. Uh, you could not get much appeal from electricity service because it's not reliable or getting connected to the grid may be too onerous. Um, there might be, I think, as the kind of... Uh, 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 the there there could be a, an awareness issue that people are are not aware that there's electricity access in those areas or that it's not widespread enough to um to to be a draw and uh, the one that pains me as a somebody who's focused on electricity for so many years is that it just may not be as appealing as other factors um it could be that labor opportunities are uh, are not necessarily connected to electricity access uh, in the same ways it could be that um it simply isn't enough of a draw compared to other uh, the the things that pe keep people in at, at home otherwise uh and so uh any number of reasons this is the kind of thing where uh we we believe this is a a uh, this connects with the literature in some ways but also challenges it in other ways and um we we're happy for this to be kind of a, a jumping off point for the kinds of techniques that we can uh kinds of questions we can answer with a technique like this by looking at uh a large number of um of circumstances and, and looking at a, a, a wide array of questions. Um, there's, there's, Lisa. there's a really simple explanation, which is that the electricity will be provided to areas which have a lot of settlement already. And so there's less room to grow, right? So you want to have more activity there because there's less room to grow, whereas the electricity will not go to places that are undersettled because there's not enough of the catchment area to pay the price. For the, for the deployment, and so there's room to grow. So um, it's a it's a great hypothesis. The room to grow bit, um, I can understand the the difficulty of connection, whatever else. But room to grow, these tend to be less dense settings. Like the the treatment settings are less dense than the settings that, uh, as far as number of structures per unit area, um, and so there there likely is available land. Uh, we could look at the sizes of buildings and, and compare, but I don't know if that's going to, um, uh, my, my intuition would be that that wouldn't um, be vastly different in these settings. So as far as space to grow, perhaps maybe value of land or other things like that, that prevent um, uh, growth into these spaces uh, very well could be a, a deterrent. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's a fine hypothesis. The challenge with this is that Without the the kind of detailed information you get from talking to people, it's actually hard to um, fully validate any many of these hypotheses. On, on, on a super note, how do you uh, determine the set of variables that go into the matching of this? Ah, so the the so there could uh, be lots of yes. Um, so in, in particular here, we looked at population, urban rural catchment, and multidimensional poverty. Um, here, this was a little bit bespoke in that we were uh, bound to uh, characteristics where we had longitudinal data. And here, we we kind of stuck with um, ones that tell us about the, the people and the economies in these settings. Uh, we certainly could have tried others, and perhaps for robustness, we ought to, to, to see if the same conclusions come if we try a different set of um, of these, but uh, typically ones that are spatially available in rural settings from the last 15, 20 years, isn't that large of a set. No, so I was wondering about uh, night lights, because there's quite a lot of night light data sets from space, and that might be one that is a proxy to electricity as well. Sure, so night lights is a, is a good one. Um, it, we, it gets used for all sorts of different uh, purposes in, in understanding rural economies. Uh, these were all Unelectrified settings in 2009, there's essentially nil nightlights in almost all of these settings at that point. So we wouldn't have been able to, to differentiate um, uh, between the two types of settings very well. Um, uh, please. 
Oh, sorry, um, I, it'd be interesting. Do you, do you have any information on the sort of poverty index at the end of the um, ten-year period, and whether they're still similar? Yeah, that's a good. Um, that's a good question. Um, I did. Uh, we can we can see uh, how that. Uh, varies at 2019. Um, we did not look at that, but uh, if if that shows any difference, that might be an indicator that uh, other things may have changed, but not necessarily, um, uh, it might not have to deal directly with, with electricity. I think one of the larger pieces of this connects to um, this, this golden thread idea that energy ties a bunch of things together. In some ways, yes, you have to think of all of the inputs that you need in order to grow the energy, but electricity access by itself uh, isn't necessarily there. And electricity is also just a subset of energy. Uh, there are other kinds of energy that are that are quite relevant and perhaps more relevant here as well. Um, and so uh, I, I would imagine that the poverty index as a kind of um, something that shows the the true tying together of, uh, of functioning economies uh, might have a, a better indication. So it's a really good suggestion to to go look at that 2019 value of multidimensional poverty index. The reason I ask um, is, I guess, my intuition on the explanation for that divergence in many countries, and particularly in Kenya. I don't know exactly where your location is, but um, you have some people, poor people from rural communities coming to urban areas. They would yeah. initially keep the parts of land, which aren't really going to have electricity. So you might see a huge expansion of informal settlements in the areas that don't have electricity. The, the rich areas that do have electricity will become more formalized, more expensive to go to, so that's why they have a slower growth rate in buildings. So it'd just be interesting, like maybe at the beginning of the 10-year period, they were similar in terms of poverty um, rates, but maybe at the end they drifted and become so structurally different. Yeah, I think the the kind of notion of migration and, and urban migration is a very, very kind of challenging one in that there's various flows of this. There's moving from true rural hinterlands into third tier cities, third tier to second tier cities, second tier to um, first tier cities, the growth in informal settlements and slums and and all of this, like it's, they're, they're all thought of as urban rural migration, but really they, there's different drivers, different um, different circumstances. There's seasonality to this as well. Uh, it, it becomes a very, very challenging um, uh, landscape. We actually have some ongoing work in the in 26 informal settlements in Kampala uh, to understand electricity challenges. And there we are applying surveys and, and sensors uh, to better understand the, the energy systems. But uh, uh, yeah, it's it's difficult to paint with such a broad brush. Here we, we focused on places that were um, deep rural. So we stayed generally, not deep rural, um, consistently rural. So we stayed away from uh, peri-urban centers around large cities, things like that. We, we focused on places that had uh, relatively uh, lower population densities than what you would see around cities. Um, but it's a fair point that there's a lot of different dynamics that are happening here. This is uh, a highly simplified view at it, but we hoped with a large enough sample that was specific enough that we would um, be able to find something perhaps useful or surprising. Um, so uh, the the case study here could certainly be more developed, and I think part of the challenge of this work is we we develop a technical capability as well as try and show how it can be useful. Uh, and you know, there's there's plenty of opportunity to poke holes in both of those, and and those points are are very well taken. Um, in general, uh, we want to understand though what this technical capability of looking at longitudinal high resolution imagery, what that enables us broadly. We've looked at flooding risk as well, just to understand if places that uh, have um, lower or higher risk of flooding, how, th how that growth ha tends to happen. So that's another um, another one. We did roughly um, similar analysis, but with a, a flooding risk data set. Here we found that places with lower risk of flooding tended to grow slightly faster. Um, and so these kinds of, of things we're, we're after, and as a um, uh, very last uh, approach, um, we're also looking at uh, road quality. I mentioned this earlier, but this is one that employs the same sort of high resolution longitudinal imagery, trying to understand whether the quality of roads, this is a, a before on top and an after on bottom in four different cases, um, whether the quality of roads changing uh, has impacts on 
um, on outcomes, uh, whether it's economic or uh, in this particular work, we're working with the World Bank to understand conflict and this relationship in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo between road quality and conflict and access to, to rural communities. Um, but we're able to kind of uh, actually infer about when roads have been widened or uh, tarmac uh, paved in, in cases. Uh, and so we look at specific in investments and try and understand what the impacts of those are. Uh, but again, it's this this notion of working with uh, historical um, high resolution imagery. Uh, so I know I'm at time. I appreciate all of the the wide array of questions and, and things like that. I'm happy to to stay over uh, as long as people are willing. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, some sort of just follow up with that. So Jay, we have the room for another hour, and Jay has been kindly kind enough to stay on if needed. Uh, I think some people want to talk to him already. I don't know who it was. What it was. I have one half hour uh, with Grace, I believe. On the call. And so, uh, Jay, your co host, so let me just stop the recording for this call. Sorry. Jay, can I just applaud uh, the, the, the 